Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Jump On Air. We're so happy you're spending a little bit of your Friday with us as we talk about statistics, science, data, and of course, Jump. My name is Julian Paris. I'm the Learning Strategy Manager here at Jump Software. And as always, I get the privilege of being your host for Jump On Air. We have a really great show for you today, packed with lots of speakers who are going to share their stories and share their knowledge. I'm going to show this schedule as often uh, as we can between shows so that we can keep things on track. And so you know that you can always come in at a time when a show is scheduled. And so remember, you can always disconnect and come back. That link is very simple to remember. It is simply jump.com slash jump on air, which will take you right back to the live stream on any device you want. So if you need to go for a run, take us with you. If you need to make it to the kitchen, take us with you. We hope you'll join us for all of our show's uh, great episodes today. Now, after the show, we hope you'll join us in the community at community.jump.com slash jump on air. That's where you can watch all the previous episodes. You can watch the previous segments specifically. And that's also where you can interact with our great speakers and guests. So join us in the community at community.jump.com slash jump on air and keep the conversation going. Once you're there, you can click on the labels on the right hand side to filter by the type of show. And you can, of course, view the whole episodes at the very top. All right, so before we get started on our show, I always like to kick it off with a little bit of an introduction. This time, I'd like to actually do something we've done before, and I'm going to do the till surge. Today, I learned something really good. You might remember I did this on our first episode two weeks ago, and actually, I want to return to that particular topic because I learned something else really good today about that topic. Now, we have a lot of new viewers, so I want to remind you what I talked about. I actually introduced you to some supercomputers. And I started by introducing you to Summit, this 200 petaflop supercomputer. And a petaflop was a million, billion, billion floating point operation per second that a computer can do. So this is a really, really fast computer. It's actually the fastest single supercomputer in the world today at Oak Ridge La National Laboratories. So I told you about that supercomputer, and then I told you about my very not supercomputer back in 2004, my 5 or 4 gigaflop Pentium 4 uh, processor that was not doing as much as Summit, of course, but I was actually able to put that computer to work in a pretty large scale project called Folding at Home. And Folding at Home, in case you don't know or didn't know before, is a project where you can combine computing resources with a lot of other people to do really amazing things. And the thing I told you about last time was that Folding at Home gained a lot of traction because of coronavirus and people wanting to do something with their home computer's time, with their Android's phone time, you know, with, with all their devices. They wanted to put them to good use. And so Folding at Home saw a really amazing thing happen, which is that in late February, they actually ended up being more powerful than the top seven supercomputers in the world, which is an impressive thing. But the even more impressive thing I told you about last time was that by late March, they had broken the exaflop scale and had essentially taken us into new territories with computing power that our world had never seen before. Now, if you weren't here on the last show, I wanted to show you and jump what that really looked like because it's so impressive. And this is a data table again, I'll share with you on our community. But I have actually the top 500 supercomputers in this data table, and I've just made a packed bar chart. So a chart that allows us to actually look at all the supercomputers and see the top 10 here as separate bars and then just pack in the, the computing power of the rest of them. So Summon was the computer I showed you at first, that amazingly fast supercomputer. Sierra is up here. Um, I don't know what it is with supercomputers. They all look so amazing. I guess if you're spending that much money to build it, you make it look good. So what I did last time is I showed you uh, on this same plot what it looked like to see folding at home. And so folding at home in February was way faster than Summit, pretty pretty darn impressive. But then by uh, March, essentially, it was that breaking the exaflop scale. And so just so fabulously faster than Summit and the rest of them. But I wanna show you what happened in actually the last month. And this is something I saw just a few days ago. And let me show you Folding at Home now. Folding at Home not only doubled uh, what it was back in early February, uh, it almost doubled what it was in March. It's now up to 2.4 petaflops, sorry, 2.4 exaflops, so in the exascale. And I'll, I'll put back on the other two just so you can see how much folding at home has increased here. And so it is an unbelievable computing power. But what's kind of special about 2.4, where it is now, is it is actually faster than the combined uh, power of all these other supercomputers. And so I'm just going to take down the packed primaries in Graph Builder. And so what I'm doing is stacking up all those smaller computing powers into bigger and bigger stacks. 
And let's take it down to just two stacks. And so Summit is still here, that fastest single supercomputer, right? And Sierra is the next one. It's still here in this stack. But now I've added up the computing power of every other supercomputer up to the 500th. And folding at home is more powerful than all of them. And so this is the, the till search for today. This is the thing that I just learned based on, uh, they actually tweeted this out, uh, that folding at home now is more powerful than the top 500 supercomputers in the world. And this is in incredible. So I just want to tell you again, if you are willing to contribute your time, go to foldingathome.org and also contribute your computer. And maybe we can push it to even crazier levels and that they can start solving even harder problems. Um, I didn't show it last time, but you can actually designate uh, which thing you want to submit your computer's power to. So you can see I have coronavirus or COVID-19 selected there. And you can decide how much of your computing time you want to, to give it. So this is on one of my other computers, and I always have it set to full. And so it's just running as much as it, it can to, to process these things. Um, and for fun, you can actually look at where people are folding across the world. So I really encourage you to hit foldingathome.org, download this, and submit some of your computing time too. Because together we can do some pretty amazing things, and uh, you know, they're a great organization to, to contribute to. All right, so that was today. Today I learned something really good. Now we have a really awesome show for you. We hope you stick around for the whole thing. Uh, I'm really excited about our first speaker, and it's Ann Milley with Jonah Berger, best-selling author from New York Times and also Wharton professor, who's going to tell us about his new book about changing minds. So we are really excited to feature Dr. Jonah Berger. As Julian said, he's a professor at Wharton and he's an uh, international best-selling author. You can see some of his books here. And uh, we're going to be featuring him as the first guest on Meet the Author segment on Jump On Air. Jonah, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much for having me. So we really enjoyed your book, um, Contagious, which you spoke about at Jump Discovery Summit 2014. And we're very pleased to see your new book, The Catalyst, out and doing very well. Please tell us what inspired you to write it. Yeah, so uh, Contagious came out uh, a number of years ago. And, and since then, I've had the chance to work with a variety of companies and organizations. So everything from big companies like the Googles and Apples and Nikes of the world to small startups. Uh, and what I realized was that every company, every organization, every person I talked to basically had some version uh, of the same problem, which is they all had something that they wanted to change. Uh, employees wanted to change their boss's mind and leaders wanted to transform organizations. Marketing people wanted to change uh, the customer's mind and change consumer behavior. Uh, startups wanted to change industries, nonprofits wanted to change the world. Uh, but there was one problem, which is that change was really hard, right? Often people were pushing and providing more information and reasons and it, it wasn't working. And so I started in some sense on a journey trying to figure out, well, could there be a better way to, to change minds and, and drive action? And if so, what was it? Awesome. Well, um, what is a catalyst and how does that concept apply to your approach? Yeah, so uh, many of your audience are probably familiar with the idea in chemistry of, of a catalyst. I think more of us are familiar with it uh, in, the, in the broader notion of sort of something that changes something else. But in chemistry, it has a very specific uh, meaning that I think is actually quite a uh, useful one, which is, uh, as you know, chemistry changes really hard. Uh, not only is it harder and when changing our boss's mind, it's much harder to change certain molecules or compounds into different things. Uh, and so chemists often add uh, substances to make change happen fast and easier. They often increase the temperature or increase the pressure to make reactions uh, happen. But there's a special substance that they use, a special set of substances uh, that don't require more temperature or more pressure. And sometimes they create an alternate way for reactions to occur. They make the same change happen faster and easier and, and with less energy. And you might say, well, how is that possible? Uh, but these things do it through lowering the barrier to change. They don't add more temperature. They don't add more pressure. Essentially, they find an alternate path that requires less energy. Uh, and these substances are called catalysts. And that's exactly what the book is all about. Usually, when we try to change minds, when we try to drive action, we think about some version of pushing. We add more energy. Uh, we think if we just give someone more reasons, more facts, more figures, if I just make one more presentation, uh, people will come around. Uh, but that often doesn't work. When we push people, they often don't go, they often push back. Uh, and so the book is all about, hey, there's actually a better way. 
not by pushing, but by removing those barriers to change, by figuring out what the obstacles or barriers are and, and mitigating them. I think a, a really good analogy, if you think about it, you know, imagine you're in a car and it's parked on like an incline or something like that and you're trying to get it to go and you put your foot on the gas and it won't go and it won't go. You know, often when we want to change something, we think we just need more gas. If we just step harder on that gas pedal, people will move. Uh, but less often do we say, well, wait, maybe I just need to depress that parking brake. And so the book is really about, you know, what are those hidden parking brakes, those obstacles, or those barriers that often get in the way of change without us realizing it and how by mitigating them can we make change more likely. So interesting and it reflects like the emotional attachment that people have and you just need to remove those barriers to let them let go maybe. And sorry, emotional attachment is certainly one. You know, one thing I talk about in the book is this notion of endowment. We're attached to old things. Uh, you know, uh, people who the longer they've lived in a home, for example, the more they value it above and beyond market price because mm -hmm. they're emotionally attached to it, right? I've lived mm -hmm. there for so long. All my memories are attached in this place. I don't want to let it go. Um, and so there's lots of research on the status quo bias and the endowment effect that shows we're very reticent to get rid of old things. At the same time, we're also scared of new things, right? Mm -hmm. New things often involve uncertainty. Uh, and so there are a variety of different things with both letting go of the old as well as being scared of the new and some other things as well that, that often make change hard. Change is hard. Well, in the introduction to your book, you make the distinction between changing minds and changing behaviors. And I want to just read quickly a short a couple of sentences. You write, sometimes you don't need to change someone's mind to drive action. Sometimes people are already open to changing their behavior. You just need to remove the roadblocks and make it easier to happen, as you were just saying. But then I have to ask, too, did you get some flack for the subtitle of how to change anyone's <laughs> mind? You know, uh, I spent a while thinking about what, what to title this book. And I think uh, the first thing uh, when someone reads that subtitle is they go, anyone? I mean, we, we can't change anyone's mind, right? I mean, sure, maybe we can change some people's minds, but anyone? What about someone of a different political party? Uh, you know, what about uh, someone who's really, you know, unwilling to, to change their minds? Uh, but what's interesting is, is, you know, I interviewed some people for this book. And yes, I interviewed great leaders and great salespeople and people who got their boss to come around. But I also interviewed some people who change is even more difficult. Uh, I talked to hostage negotiators that get people to come out with their hands up. I talked to substance abuse counselors that get people to quit even after they've tried dozens of times and failed. I even talked to a rabbi who got a former grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan to renounce the Ku Klux Klan and, and sort of you know, give up those affiliations. I talked to Republicans that became Democrats. I talked to Democrats that became Republicans. And so what I don't mean to suggest is that changing anyone's mind is easy. There are certainly some people that are harder to change than others. There are certainly some issues that are harder to change than others. Uh, one distinction I make in the book is sort of between pebbles and boulders, right? Are we moving something that's relatively small, like a pebble? Yeah, it requires some, some effort, but not that much effort. We're trying to move a boulder, which is going to be a lot bigger and a lot harder to change. And sure, some of us are trying to move big, difficult things. But even in those really difficult situations, even when we might say, there's no way a Democrat would become a Republican. There's no way a Republican would become a Democrat. There's no way you know, a Ku Klux Klan member would, would give it all up. Um, people did change their minds. And so I think if you apply these tools right, if you understand those barriers that are preventing change, we really can change anyone's mind. Yes, and, and behavior too. Good. Yeah. Well, um, so you mentioned uh, barriers and you mentioned one of them, but can you tell us the five barriers to change? Sure. Uh, so the first is reactance. Uh, the second is endowment. The third is distance. The fourth is uncertainty. And the fifth is corroborating evidence. And if you put those five together, they are in an acronym. Uh, they spell reduce, which is exactly what good catalysts do. Uh, they don't push harder. They don't provide more facts, more figures, and more reasons. They figure out what those barriers are, uh, and they mitigate them. And I think, by the way, that's really hard for us to do. You know, I did a lot of research looking at a variety of different individuals. I find that barrier blindness is really prevalent. Many people, if you ask them what they want to change, they have a really good sense of the outcome that they want to achieve, but they have a very bad sense about the barriers that are preventing change from happening. You know, most people know, well, the boss said no, or the client didn't accept the project, or the thing didn't happen. But if you ask them why, they're often unaware of why it didn't happen. And so we really have to start with that person whose mind we're trying to change. You think about a doctor, for example. You know, you walk into a doctor's office, a doctor doesn't say, okay, here's a Band-Aid or here's a finger splint. They start with a diagnostic to figure out what the problem is. And the same thing here. We have to start with that person who are trying to change, start with them, figure out what things are preventing them from engaging that desired action, and use that to mitigate those barriers and encourage them to come around. 
Very good. Well, um, you mentioned the different uh, case studies very briefly, and they were just so compelling, these examples to illustrate how you can overcome those five barriers. How did you curate these case studies? <laughs> you know, I, I wish I could say I had a magic formula and I know the exact right way to do it. Um, you know, I teach at the Wharton School. I've been a professor there now for uh, over 13 years. Um, examples came from class, examples came from research, examples came from presenting these ideas in executive education sessions. Uh, often, sometimes, people would hear something and go, oh, but, you know, can really anyone's mind be changed? You know, you should talk to these type of people. And so it's really interesting seeing some of the same types of approaches across areas. Uh, the first chapter, for example, is all about reactants, mm -hmm. all about when you push people, they often push back. And I, I talk about some strategies there where uh, parenting experts talk about applying them with their kids uh, and smart consultants talk about using them with their clients. Uh, and really from two or three different angles, I saw different groups of people applying the same under underlying idea uh, in slightly different ways. And so part of the fun of writing this book was really seeing how the same basic psychological principles can be applied in a whole host of situations, sometimes applied slightly differently, sometimes with a bit more nuance or a bit more detail in one place versus another. But the ideas, the core principles are, are very much the same. Well, I loved how you were so objective and how you treated, you know, these case studies to recount the um, ins and outs of, of how the change happened. But I'm wondering if people identify with one of those um, people, like a Democrat or Republican or what have you, yeah. you think it's hard for them to read and examine their own ways of thinking. You know, uh, uh, so uh, if uh, the, the book came out uh, and there were some early reviews before it was actually even out. So we uh, gave it to some sort of uh, readers uh, who were able to read it online through the Amazon Vine program. Uh, and a couple of those early readers got a little bit upset um, because they felt like some of the examples were things they didn't think needed to be changed. So, you know, they might have been one member of a certain political party. They didn't believe someone should change to the other side. Um, they might have felt a certain social issue. There was a right and a wrong. And, you know, there's no reason that people should be changed on that social issue. Um, uh, you know, it's not my job to tell people how to be. Uh, I think that's a little bit uh, narrow-minded, but I think the principles are, are very much the same. And so I tried hard in the book not to take a political stance to show that, you know, whether you agree with one side or the other, there are people that move in both sides. Right. Um, and I think understanding those principles and why they work can be applied to, to any situation. I think some people would say, well, oh, you know, aren't we manipulating people? Or, oh, you know, aren't we using these tools for evil. I mean, that's, that's a tough question. And I think, you know, even a hammer can be used uh, for bad things. Uh, it's not the hammer itself that's bad. It's how we use it that, that's bad. And so my hope really is to help people apply these tools for good, uh, to change the world in, in good ways by understanding why change hasn't happened already. All right. Well, I like that you use such compelling examples. I thought it, was, <laughs> it made it so much more interesting to read. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. You mentioned earlier about we shouldn't just push on the gas more and we can't just, um, you know, keep going with the facts and the figures. So why doesn't that work? Or might that work with some people that are maybe a little bit more logical and don't have as many barriers to overcome? Yeah, you know, I think particularly for, for this audience, more of a sort of a technical, uh, tech savvy, um, you know, highly educated audience, um, we think that people are like us, right? That everyone should behave rationally, that if you just give people the right information, they'll come around. Um, I think a good analogy to think about it, you know, imagine you're in a room with a chair and you want a chair to move in a certain direction. Pushing that chair is a great way to get it to go. You push that chair in the direction that you want it to go, the chair goes in the direction that you want it to go. Uh, but there's one problem, people are not chairs. Uh, and when you push people, they often dig in their heels. They don't just go along, they push back. We have, in some sense, an anti-persuasion radar, uh, a defense system almost. You think about a spidey sense or a missile defense system uh, that goes off when we hear someone trying to persuade us, right? We avoid the message. We ignore it. Think about when you get a call from a telemarketer or an email from a salesperson. We often hit delete without reading it. We know someone's trying to persuade us. Our defenses, our radar goes up. We knock down those incoming projectiles. But even worse, someone seems like they're listening, but they're actually spending a lot of time counter-arguing. Yes, they're shaking their head and they're listening to what we're saying, but in their mind, they're thinking about all the reasons why what we're suggesting is wrong. Oh, that will cost too much. Oh, that won't actually work. Oh, that is difficult to, to apply or this other person won't, won't like it. And so rather than just sitting there passively listening, they're thinking about all the reasons why they don't like what, what we're suggesting. And, and at the core, that barrier is reactance. I talk about that a lot in the reactance chapter, how people like to think they're the drivers of their own behavior. And so we really need to make them feel like they're, they're in control. 
rather than trying to sell something, get people to buy in, rather than trying to persuade someone, get them to persuade themselves by understanding how to make them part of the decision-making process and give them that sense of agency. I think it's so important that we all know about different ways of thinking and overcoming change because we all have different people that we deal with. So yeah, uh, certainly. Yeah. Good, good. Well, um, does culture influence how people react to messages and recommendations um, and warnings? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting question. I just wrote a piece uh, for HBR uh, related to the coronavirus, um, uh, all about sort of, you know, applying these tools and techniques to um, getting people to engage in health behaviors that they should engage in or avoid going out or wear masks and so on. Uh, and what's so interesting uh, is often uh, telling people not to do something actually can make them more likely uh, to do it. Talk about that idea of reactance. When we tell people what to do, they say, well, don't tell me what to do. I want to do what, whatever I want. Um, and and so we need to figure out how to get them to come along, not by telling them what to do, but again, engaging them in that process. You know, you mentioned culture. Uh, I tell a great story uh, in that reactance chapter about an anti-smoking ad uh, from Thailand. So it's this organization that wants people to call a quit line. Rather than telling people to quit, what they do is they have kids walk up to smokers uh, on the street uh, and ask those smokers, hey, can I get a light? Now imagine you're a smoker, the little kid comes up to you and asks you to have a light, you say, no, of course not, right? And they shoot these amazing videos of the smokers telling these kids why smoking is a terrible idea. It's bad for your lungs, you wanna be able to exercise, don't you wanna go run and play? Nobody knows more about the dangers of smoking than, than smokers. Um, and at the end of that interaction, the kid hands the smoker a piece of paper that says, you worry about me, but why not yourself, right? Uh, if you wanna quit, call this helpline. Now notice what they didn't do. They didn't tell the smokers, you have to quit. Here's what you should do. They just did what I'd call highlighting a gap. They pointed out a gap between what the smoker's doing for themselves and what they would recommend for someone else. And then they leave that gap to let the smoker deal with it. Uh, and it leverages what's called cognitive dissonance. When people's attitudes and their actions don't line up, they often want to do some work to bridge that gap, to make their attitudes and their actions more in line. Uh, and so in this case, many smokers called the quit line and quit because they didn't want to seem like they were being hypocritical. I told those kids not to smoke. I probably shouldn't smoke either. Now, that's examples from Thailand, um, uh, but I'm sure many of us listen and can resonate with that, that same idea. We can apply the same notion of highlighting a gap, very different context, but to the office, right? Imagine there's a, a boss or a colleague that doesn't want to kill an old project. The project is losing money or it's not working, but they don't want to kill it. They have that status quo bias. They're attached to it. Rather than telling them, no, we should kill this project, what if you say, well, hey, would you recommend another company start this project? Or hey, if a different department knew what we knew now, would you recommend they do something similar? And that colleague would probably say, no, I mean, knowing what we know now, we definitely wouldn't start something like this. Okay, well, then why are we doing it, right? right? And again, not telling them don't do it, but encouraging them to see, well, hold on. That's an interesting point. I said this, but I'm also feeling this. These two things aren't in line. How do I make them work together? And so encouraging them to do the work themselves. Right. Thank goodness people do such creative experiments for us to understand these things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, Jonah, this has been such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for taking the time and no um, want to recommend your book again to our viewers. And if you want to get the very compelling introduction to Jonah's book, you can go to jump.com slash catalyst. Thanks again, Jonah. Back Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks so much. And uh, we'll come back here in a second. We're ending a little bit early, so what I'm going to do is just give us a little bit of a break here just so that we uh, stick a little close to our schedule. So join us back in a few minutes and we'll be right back on air.
everyone. Welcome back. Uh, in our next segment, we're going to have Pete and Mary back to uh, act out a real-life situation where a jump tip is actually the solution. Pete and Mary? Hi, welcome to Jump On Air's tip of the day. Uh, today, uh, Mary is going to help me with the scenario. So last week, well, actually, it was a couple months ago now, um, I was having an office space moment. So it was the end of the day. I saw my boss, Brady, coming down the hallway, and I really wanted to get out of there and get to happy hour before he caught me and uh, started talking my ear off. So uh, hopefully Brady's not watching this, but uh, Mary, is there a quick and easy way where I can save everything really quickly and run out the door before Brady catches me next time? Oh yeah, I'm so glad you asked me that because how many times we've been interrupted, we're running, the computer shuts down, the company does a reboot, and then where's my data, where's my data? So this is one of my features that I like. So let me share my screen and um, we'll go from there. All right, so you see I have this journal here and let me bring uh -huh. in my, my window and I have a lot of stuff I've been working on, solar farm, auto, raw auto data and stuff. And, and I put some things in my journal and you notice with journals, everything has to be done on the bottom. So if I right mouse click, I get mm -hmm. this, these options. But my favorite one of all time is add all open files on the go. So if I select all add all open, add all open files, you can see here that it takes in everything I have listed here and puts all the files that I've been using on that window list in the journal. And so I chose and saves things that I've created. I have the distributions here. I have the raw data that I can always go and retrieve. And so I love it because now I just got a quick snapshot. I can go off, I can save this, file save, uh, save the journal off and go to my lunch meeting, go to where I need to go and I know I have all my information. Plus, I don't know about you, sometimes I get really busy drilling down and doing row states and all kinds of stuff and I like to save everything at once. That so once again, underneath, add all open files oh that is great mary i i really appreciate that and and you brought up a good point every time that uh they roll out an update it rolls out an update and says your computer's going to restart in five seconds this yep. is a great way to deal with that not just escape for happy hour <laughs> so well, I, I appreciate there's it that, there's that too <laughs> and running to the airport <laughs> well not every, these days <laughs> right you had a gate change something like that okay well yep. thank yep. you mary and uh that's been our jump on air tip of the day thank you pete Thanks so much, Pete and Mary. Just a reminder to everyone, if you have tips you would like Pete and Mary to share, make sure to head on over to their community segment page, community.jump.com slash jump on air, and leave a comment on a tip you'd like them to act out or share with all of you on Jump on Air. Our next segment, we have the data doctor back to take us through some new things or other things we can do in Jump that you may not have known about. Hi, everybody. Get my video going here. Welcome to today's show. And I just learned that I've got some extra time, which was great because I was, I was going to be pressed for time. And I actually decided to slow things down and just cover one topic instead of two. But now I think we'll be able to cover them both. Uh, so today's show is going to show you how to do some things in Jump that build on, on built-in features, but that add significantly more power. And we'll actually start, because I've got this extra time today, we'll actually start on the selection front. And what we are going to do is, is first of all, introduce the name and selection, name selection and column feature, which may, some of you may not know is there. We've got some great ways to select data, and this is one of them. And, well, actually, it's not selecting data, but it's helping you record what you selected. So let's take a look at that. 
just to introduce that idea. So let's say I've got a graph and I find something interesting in the graph. And so I, I highlight some points and then I look in the data table and I would like to remember that selection so that I don't have to you know, guess exactly how to select those points in the future. That's something that's built right into jump in the rows section of our menu. If we come down here to row selection about halfway down, all the way to the bottom, name selection and column. And what this will let us do is we get to pick a column name and we get to say what we would like the selected columns to be labeled. So I'll just put a one there and the unselected columns, I'll put a zero there. We'll just treat this like a flag, but I could put text if I wanted. When we're done, we hit okay. And you'll notice that all the selected rows have the label they're supposed to and the unselected rows get their label. And this is nice because if I ever came back to this table and in this graph and I wanted to select those same points again, I could just select the one and then right click and select matching cells and I get my selection back. So that's pretty nice. What I want though, is for this to be dynamic. That adds significant power is, is if I could actually select, make a selection either in the data table itself or in some report that's linked to the data table and have these points respond. And, that, and that's not happening here. So how can I get that to happen? Well, I'm going to delete the column I just made, and make a new one and we can get this with a formula column it's a simple formula, but you might want to write it down because it's not one that you'd probably remember offhand. It's going to be the selected function. And then as its argument, row state. And that is also a function. So we, we need parentheses there. Selected row state. Okay, that's, that's the function we want. Let's hit okay and bring that in. Now watch what happens. Anytime I select a row, I get a one in that column and the rows that are not selected get zeros. Okay, pretty straightforward what that's doing. And this of course works because everything's linked. It works whether I'm in the data table or in a report that uh, is linked to that data table. So this is really powerful. And we're going to see a couple of reasons why here. First, um, it, the continuous case, that column, I can make it continuous or discrete. And if I make it continuous, I can do math. I can average or I can sum. And if I average, that's actually giving me the proportion of rows that I've selected. If you think about averaging ones and zeros, when you take the average, it's just gonna tell you the proportions of ones you had. Uh, I could sum this up instead, and that will give me the number of rows that got selected. And so the punchline here is that we can update a report or a graph just by making selections somewhere else in jump. And, and so very powerful here. And to, to take a look at that in action, we'll notice that I did put this selected row state column into a data table here. Okay, I've got a continuous and a nominal version. We'll work with the continuous version. And this data set has complaints about people's trucks. So I've got a manufacturer name among other things. And I've also got system flags. So 35 different columns here and I'll just double click on the breaks column, take us over there. And so when I see a one, that's telling me that this person, this row of data had a problem with the breaks. And you can see that if I select the matching cells, I, I look down, I've got over 9,000 rows of data where people had problems with their breaks. Now, rather than go through and scroll and do that select matching cells thing, um, I actually wrote a dashboard that'll illustrate this point. And what the dashboard does is down below, I've got a data table where I put event handlers in. And so that I can just click, you know, like air conditioner. There's 160 air conditioner problems apparently in this data set. And if you look at the report that just came up, Okay, if you add those numbers in that lower graph, that's gonna to add to 160. Those are the 160 air conditioner issues broken down by manufacturer name. Similarly, up top, I, I get the proportion that those events represent in that manufacturer's data. So what, what I'm saying, for example, is that the 45 instances of the air conditioner problem among the Fords represent 0.3% 
of the Ford data in the data set, 0.3% of Ford's rows in the data set, if you will. So we can check it out for breaks. And then we're going to get this updating. So why is this happening? It's because I am selecting, by clicking this one, I'm going back to that original table and selecting those 9,444 cells and it is updating this table dynamically. So anything I do in that original table just updates this one. And what's great is that it's not dependent solely on this dashboard I wrote. Remember, this is linked to that original table. So I could do something like run text explorer. And when my text explorer results come back, I might see something I, I wanna investigate like windshield wipers. And so I can just select the, the rows that um, are associated with windshield wipers, not through a flag in the data set, but in the text that is actually in that data set that Text Explorer has processed. And you'll notice I've selected some rows here in the data set, uh, about 1600, almost 1700. And if I actually go back to my dashboard here, okay, these now are those 1600 rows that we selected. Okay, so this, that has updated this. So bottom line is I can drive reports by looking at either sums of that flag or averages of that flag. And it's, it's all driven by selections I make, uh, whether it's in a dashboard, whether it's in a report, a graph, what have you. A very powerful thing to do. Now, what about if we have the nominal case? Let's take a look. At a, at a couple of those. What the nominal case is going to allow us to do is to use this selection flag as a grouping variable. So I get, I can do an A versus B comparison. I can say, well, let me, let me investigate those selected cells versus everybody else. Are they the same? Are they different? Do they look like they're within the distribution? Let's take a look at that. And we, and we can also do a very powerful extension of the local data filter to be selection based and instead of column based. Uh, we'll see that as well. So here's a data set about candy bars. And when I was looking through this data set, I wanted to find a candy bar that was pretty high in non-saturated fat and pretty for the amount of calories it had. So we're, you know, the, the candy interested in or, you know, in this portion of the graph. And what I did was I put that selection column in that nominal column. And you'll notice that I've, I've got a, box plot here and a violin plot, but I, I've got my selected variable there and it's just reading as zero. And similarly, I've got a tabulate over here and I've inverted the selection of zero. So it's showing me things that are not selected equals zero, which is precisely selected equals one in this case. Um, nothing's showing up, but as soon as I select, something shows up. And so I get a list in the tabulate that is showing me what exactly what I selected. And that helps me not have to hover over all of these little candy bars. And in fact, that gets difficult because some of the candy bars have exactly the uh, same amount of fat and um, uh, calories. And I haven't managed to land on any of them, but sometimes when you select like say two points, you'll get three or four bars. And so this is good because the tabulate will take care of that. It'll show me everything. And so this is really cool because I could come over here and say, well, these are some of the bars I might want. Let's compare them to the others. And I can immediately see, uh, not just in this graph, but for any, for any metric that I want, I can look at the cholesterol and compare them. I can, look, and I can look at the sugars, the protein. I can go through this and it's not just for graphs like this. This could be for models that you fit. I could have, if you think about a model, I could, I could put a local data filter on a model and say, I wanna filter the selected columns for this model and then build that same model just side by side in a window and say, I, I want the unselected points to, to filter on this model. And then you'll get to see side by side model estimates for the things you've selected and the things you haven't. Think about this in the semiconductor industry where you might be looking at a, at a wafer map you might find something interesting in here and you're saying, okay, those points I selected, how do they compare to all the other points on that wafer with respect to any parameter you might want to view? As well as listing out, you know, whatever metric you wanted to associate with those particular uh, locations on the wafer, you may have 
text that you wanted to render here, and that could be you know, part of your local data filter and your tabulate. As another example of that, let's consider, uh, let me go back to clean this up a little bit. Let's go to the San Francisco crime data, which has a lot of data. I mean, too much data to ever, you know, if I, if I look at this local data filter, and again, here's the tip. When you're setting this up, put your selected flag, but, but select zero and then invert that because you won't get a one to choose if there's nothing selected yet. You won't get a zero and a one, you'll just see a zero. So you just select that and put inverse and then you're good. That's the same as picking ones. But if I turn this off, look what happens. Look at the report I get. I'm trying to turn this off. Let me just take off inverse. Look at what happens here. Way too much to read. This isn't, I mean, this is the whole data set and it's just, it's not what I'm interested in. What I want is I just want to be able to highlight a little piece of this and have this update. So not a problem. Let's um, just get the lasso here and just say, I just want this little piece just right there. Okay, boom, there, that, that shows me exactly what I want. And this would be very difficult to do with the typical local data filter because if you, if you look at the columns I have here, none of them are spatial. There, there's no Latin long, I mean, well, there is a Latin long. I guess if I knew the Latin long, I could, I could try to do that. But what if it's a funny shape? Uh, that, would, that would be difficult. So we get around all that just by setting up with the selection flag, I can go anywhere and make any kind of shape and it's not gonna be a problem. So this in generally works anywhere that you might want to do a local data filter. If you don't have the columns that can easily help you slice and dice your data, you can always do this trick and then slice and dice the data just by selecting or brushing certain points in reports. It's really, really powerful. Uh, way to do that, to extend that local data filter. All right, next up, we're going to attack a problem that we, we hear about uh, a lot from customers. And I think that th there's a feature that's relatively recent that a lot of people may not know about it is, is called um, select duplicate rows. And that lives in the row selection menu. And it's right above name selection column. So this is relatively recent. This was in the last couple of releases or so. And what's this do? Um, let's take a look. Let's just do that. Let's select the duplicate rows. Huh, does nothing apparently. Well, why is that? That's because when I don't make a column selection, and here's the trick, if I don't make a column selection, then jump is going to look at all the columns. And so the rows have to match all the way across. Every column value has to be the same for a row to be deemed a duplicate. However, if I do select a column or multiple columns, now those, only those columns will be considered. And if you look at rows seven and eight, in this respect, eight could be viewed as a duplicate of row seven, okay? And so, in that way, if I come along and try this again, ah, row eight is selected. You know, and sometimes I have even more duplicates. If I go down here a little bit further, I'll see that rows 89 and 90 are, are duplicates with respect to these first two columns of row 88. Now, why is this a thing and why can this help people? Well, we get a lot of questions about, hey, I've got um, some measurements that were taken at certain points in time, and I've got certain tool and part combinations for which these measurements are taken. But sometimes I get more than one, you know, I'll have to revisit this. Maybe something went wrong, I have to do it again, and I'll, I'll get two, maybe three, maybe four or more rows in my data set where I, I've got the same tool and part, and it's, uh, there, there's measurement going on. And, and so I get, I, I don't want all of those rows. I just want the unique rows that are the most recent. And so how can I make that happen? Well, one of the ways, if you want the most recent, is I can sort here, just sort the date and time in 
descending order. That means all the, the most recent dates are at the top of my data table. And so the, the tools and parts don't have to be contiguous. You know, they don't have to all be grouped together for this to work. It'll just go through the table and find those duplicates for you. So I can just now do that selection. And it's going to find out those 200 selected rows that are duplicates of, of some other row that came first. And remember, a row gets to come first if its date time is mo more recent. So I could just delete those 200 rows if that's all I'm after is the most recent data. Similarly, I could, I could decide I want the oldest measurement, the first measurement I want to look at. Um, well, then I sort ascending. And so that now the oldest data is at the top of the data table and I do the same trick. Or I might decide that, hey, if I have multiple measurements, it's because I wasn't happy with you know, the standard deviation. I think the tool was messed up and I'm gonna fix the tool and, I, and I'm looking for the one with the lowest standard deviation, okay? easy enough, sort that standard deviation in ascending order, and now select the duplicate rows and delete them. So why I point this out is that not a lot of people, I think, know about this because it's relatively new, especially if you've been using Jump a long time. And sometimes that's all you need. You're just, you know, really looking for that first occurrence, if you will, in the data table, and you want to you save that and delete everything else. When things get more complicated, uh, you're going to have to start using rankings, and we'll talk about that right now. So let's first of all bring up a simple data set for illustration's sake. Okay, and what I'm going to do here is I'm going to uh, I'll do a couple things here. I want to um, show you you know what I'm gonna do, this will make this easier for you. I'm gonna put numbers here that allow me to get this data set back in the shape it is right now with respect to row orders. Okay, and I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna, this is my original order. Now I'm gonna sort on group so that we can take a look right here. I'm gonna put a columns of ones and those of you that watched last week's episode uh, are going to understand what I'm about to do. Okay, I'm unclear as to why that's not, oh, it's not a sequence actually. I just want to continue sequence to end of table, yeah, or repeat it, whatever. Okay, there we go. All right, now I'm going to actually group by these letters here. And so I'm going to make a new formula column and group by that. Okay, and then I'm going to do a column cumulative sum. Let's take a look at this. It's in the row section of the new formulas, cumulative sum. Now what's happening? Let's just look at the A's. Okay, when I just look at the A's, I get one, two, three, four, five, six. Why? Well, because it keeps taking these ones and adding them up and, and accumulating them. But it starts over when I get to the B's. And it starts over again when I get to the C's. What's nice about this is that it doesn't matter how these things are sorted. Okay, it doesn't rely on that. When you write lag functions, a lot of people do this with lag functions, then the sorting matters or you have to write a bunch of logic in there. Watch what happens when I go to the original sort order. It's still okay. If I look at my A's, there's still one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, they're still going to be numbered in the order in which they occur in the data set, starting at the top of the table. So wh why is this a thing? Why is this powerful? Well, let's clean this up a little bit. And the first way I'm gonna clean this up is to realize if I just have a column of ones, there's actually a shorthand for dealing with that in the cumulative sum formula. So the column cumulative sum function takes a, a column that you'd be summing and then, a, and then group variables if they occur. Well, I can just replace this column three, it's all ones. So I can just replace it actually with the number one and I get the same behavior. So in fact, I don't even need this column of ones and so we'll get rid of it. Now let's do this. I'm going to group this to make it, or excuse me, sort on this, on these groups to make this a little more clear what's gonna happen. But now I'm gonna add some 
columns actually. And let's take a look right here at this X1 variable and this X1 within group. Okay, I'm gonna sort by X1 and group. Okay, I've put a rank function here. If you look at the function, it's a column rank and it's tied though to X1. This, this is only good for that X1 column, but what it does by group, it ranks the values of X1. So the lowest value is rank one, the next lowest value is rank two, all the way up to whatever the highest value is. I can do this in reverse order, but watch what happens. I'm gonna make sure this is still my by variable. Yep, so let's go ahead and do this in reverse order. And we'll rank this, this is in the distribution section, in reverse. Okay, the trick is I, I don't know how many each of these groups have, they don't all have six items. And so what happens when I look at the reverse rank, look at what happens to me here. I, I need extra logic, I need to know how many items are in that group for that given column and then do subtract the rank and add one. There's a lot of drama going on. Okay. Okay, before we even go there, let's just get rid of this column and go back and take a look at these numbers and these numbers. They're the same. They're the same as long as X1 is sorted, th these are going to match. The, the beauty of this column cumulative sum is all I have to do is sort a column the way I want to sort it, and these are dynamic ranks. I don't have to write three, four, five, six new column formulas. It's all right here, as long as I remember what I sorted. If I say, you know what, I, I want to rank the X2s, okay? We'll just sort those ascending, and now these ranks actually represent X2, and we could take a look at that by, by sorting by group and X2 you'll notice that these values are the ranks. Okay, if wherever I have a one, for example, that's going to be the lowest value that any of these variables have for X2. It's always gonna pick the lowest value. That's what the, this in reverse. Okay, now the ones always show me the highest value within a given group of X2. So why this is so powerful is it now allows us to greatly extend what we did before in case we need more power for, for something like that, um, you know, select duplicate cells. Let's, let's look at what we can do with this now. First of all, it lets us easily perform a bunch of queries if, if we have to do that, if we have to break out a bunch of subset tables that involve things like, oh, what are the top 10 for each group? I wanna see their top 10 or their top three or the top three territory, you know, each territory, I wanna see their top three sales, on and on and on. That's really easy with this. Okay, so let's, let's take a look here in the car physical data, data set. I've, I've got these cars grouped by country and type. And so I, I might decide, okay, within each of those categories, within each combination of country and type, I want to see the, the three most powerful cars. <laughs> Actually, let's, let's look at the three least powerful cars. Let's say I've got to buy a, a car for my teenager. I don't have a teenager yet, but when I, when I buy them a car, it will be very large and have low horsepower. So let's, let's do this. All I have to do, I've got this, this column built in right now. Okay, let's take a look at the formula. It's our column cumulative sum of ones. It's grouped by country and type. Okay, that's exactly what we want. And let's just sort that horsepower ascending. And so now what do I know? I know that a one right here means it's the first time this country and type has shown up in the table. And that is gonna mean because I sorted on horsepower that it's the lowest horsepower for that country and type. So I'll just look at the, the, the two lowest horsepower cars maybe. I just select a one and a two, then I select matching cells. Now all, any cell with one or two gets selected and I can just bust out that subset table. And now I've got my list, you know, I could sort it, clean it up and everything, but the bottom line is this list now contains for each combination of country and type in this table, 
the two least powerful vehicles. Okay, that's what, that's what this is doing in terms of horsepower. Uh, I didn't have to write a ranking for, I never will have to write a ranking formula. This is just doing it for me. And, and it's nice because even if I try to set this up for somebody, you know, I can't decide where they're going to go from there. And if it's someone who's not super familiar with uh, formula columns, they might not know to set up a rank formula and they may want to do something like, um, you know, maybe they want to know power to weight ratio. You know, maybe that's what I should have looked at. It's, it's not just enough to be low powered. It has to be heavy too, to make sure it's really slow. And so uh, I can select uh, horsepower and weight and let's do a column transform here on um, a ratio. We'll go reverse order. So now we have power to weight ratio. Let's sort that ascending. Okay, and these will be, these cars are gonna be good and slow. They got high weight, and low horsepower for the, for the weight. And we'll just pick, well, let's say the top three in each category. So I just have to grab some ones, twos, and threes, as long as I got all of those, select the matching cells, and now I'm ready to take a subset. Now you will notice these subsets coming back, uh, you know, this should have 45 cars in it, but in fact, one of these, if you look at one of the country type combinations that we've got, it, it only has one car in it. I think it was the other large, yeah, this one, this only has one car in the, in the category. So that's why we only got 43 rows instead of 45, but it's so easy to do this and I don't have to keep rewriting ranking formulas. So, so very easy to do those types of queries and just you know, table after table after table if, if you've got work where you have to do that kind of thing. It's just so fast. Last thing is maybe you've got to answer questions about um, you know, some, do a model, say, on some data by country and type, and you want to figure out, okay, which rows uh, do I need to get rid of just because there's not enough occurrences within country and type? Let's say I only want to keep, value, uh, keep countries and types where they got at least 10 cars. Well, typically what you'd have to do is, is go through, do a summary, right, by country and type, and then see that table come back, sort the rows that come back, and pick the ones that are high enough. And you'll notice I've selected 73 rows back in the main table. And so those are the 73 rows I want. These other guys don't have enough uh, observation. But I don't have to do all that and create, you know, run another platform, create a summary. All I got to do here, if I've got this ranking in place, is just go find a 10 somewhere. Okay, I find a 10 and I select the matching cells. Well, you don't, you don't have a 10 unless you have at least 10 data points in that country and type combination. So these are precisely the combinations of country and type that have at least 10 data points. So in fact, these six combinations of country and type that are selected now are the ones we want. So I can just right click right now and select the matching cells. And those are the same 73 rows that I had selected before, but I didn't have to, to make a summary table and, and sort it or do any of that work. It, it's all you know, these, these little few seconds here, a few seconds there adds up to a lot of time saved over, over an analysis. So um, that is what I have for you today. I hope you find this useful and can go practice this. I hope that this saves you a lot of time. Uh, so I will pass it back to Julian at this time. Outstanding, thank you so much, Brady. Uh, like always, Brady has such amazing things to share and got us back on schedule to almost the second. So that's a really impressive additional skill that he brings to the table. So thanks again, Brady. In our next segment, we have uh, Ryan DeWitt back to tell us about the DOE intro kit. Hello everyone, I'm Ryan DeWitt and I'm part of the Jump Customer Care Team and I wanted to quickly cover, give you an overview of what we're calling the DOE Intro Kit. It's not a welcome kit, there's one Jump Welcome Kit that's available at jump.com forward slash welcome and I covered that in another video and then I'll talk more about that in the future here. And this um, quick overview is to kind of give you an idea of how to access the DOE intro kit and then how long it takes to finish and what you're going to get out of it. So the way that you access the kit is if you go to jump.com forward slash DOE kit, 
D-O-E kit with no spaces or hyphens. You get to this registration page and on this registration page, is where you can get an overview if you're trying to explain the kit to someone of some some colleagues or maybe you want several of uh, people at your work to go through the kit this is a good overview um, of kind of what I'm explaining now once you submit the kit you come here to the actual kit I'm gonna refresh it the kit does remember where you're at is if you don't delete your browser cache the kit has um, six different sections very similar to the welcome kit you the foundation section will take you through um, I think six different interviews with Brad Jones it's kind of uh, critical if you're just getting started with DOE to understand that maybe if you've done DOE before you can skip that section that's fine but you may be interested because it's definitely something that um, is very short but um, Brad gives some really great insights into the foundation of DOE and then the um, second section is the process section this um, the process will show you exactly what it takes to go through an experiment um, regardless of the software it just kind of talks about describing specifying um, all the different steps after you're doing that you can go through a, um, a quick interaction Just let me see if I can get this right describe um, we are going to specify then we're going to design and then we're going to collect our information after we made the collection data table. We're then going to um, uh, have that model. We're going to fit that model. And then we're going to predict. Let me see if I got it right. It looks like I did. After I'm done with that, I can get a green check mark after each section. And then um, the most important section is probably for me is the custom design section. In the custom design section, I cover what it's like to do a custom design. Now, I don't go into an exhaustive tutorial on all the other different designs that are inside of Jump, but I introduce them in the next section. So after you finish custom design, you go through um, one of two experiments, and the first one being a coffee strength experiment. You can adjust these dials, and you can even look at a prediction profiler of that particular model. And this is something that you would do in jump and then come back to um, you I'm gonna select the grind let me see if I got it right looks like I didn't get it right I need to go back into jump and then run that custom design but if you go through these two experiments one is a coffee strength experiment um, using custom design and then one is a paper helicopter I feel you'll get a really good understanding about the DOE platform so after that I'm gonna mark that section complete I've now finished three quickly here um, we're then gonna cover all the different platforms that are in jump um, this is basically the overview of the menu that I was talking about you get to see all the different um, things that uh, the DOE platform offers up. And then I go through a few of them, like I go through a split plot design, a choice design over here. Um, and that pretty much gives you an overview of all the, the, the classic designs that are available, um, as well as the custom design that we're focused in on. In the tools section, I plan to expand a little bit more. I plan to put more in um, that. All the tools that support an experiment inside of Jump, I plan to put into the tools section. So that'll grow a little bit more um, in the next release. And then the experiment section is, um, this is a great, um, could be a great group exercise but you go through the paper helicopter um, experiment and you can um, print the let me see if I got the this is the paper helicopter PDF that's available that you can print up and you can go through the entire um, experiment and so the tools I need to mark complete and then the we're now into the experiment and then after the experiment you can fill all the different properties of the paper helicopter um, and no paper clip or paper clip and then if you want to look at the prediction profiler that may be helpful to you 
I am going to look at the prediction profiler, and I think it is no paper clip. I'm looking up here at the profiler. This is something that you would go through and jump. I am cheating right now, um, and I want to go to um, uh, light paper, and then I'm going to run. It looks like I got that right. And after you're done, you can um, accept, look, you can view the results like you can of, uh, with the welcome kit. And you can um, accept your results and print your certificate. Again, because of this demo, I haven't done quite well. Um, quite, in fact, uh, I've done terribly. So um, you can restart the course, exit the, the course, or you can um, print print your results. So I'm just going to restart the course and that's it for the DOE intro kit. Thanks for watching. Back to you, Julian. Thanks so much, Ryan. And yeah, you can find that DOE intro kit and we highly recommend you take it if you have an interest in design of experiments and you'd like to see how it works in Jump. In our next segment, we have Jordan Hiller back to take us through his program, Jump Can Do That. Okay, thanks, Julian. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Jump Can Do That. This is the segment where we look at uses for Jump that are not related to stats and data viz, things that are off-label, if you will. I wanted to call this stupid jump tricks, but Julian vetoed that, so here we are, Jump Can Do That. And uh, today our topic is fun and games. Uh, how did this come about? Well, people are sometimes surprised to learn, uh, especially people beginning with Jump, uh, that, that Jump has a full program language underneath it, a very robust language called JSL, Jump Scripting Language. And you can do just about everything that you would do in a standard programming language right here in Jump. So people who are learning to program for the first time or learning a new programming language, having done programming in another language, one of the things you'll often do is, is make a game, a simple game. And uh, Jump is no different. There are many, many versions out there of different games that have been implemented in Jump. And I thought it would be fun to step through a couple of uh, the examples I've found uh, that are, are really interesting or different or instructive in, in different ways. So we'll spend this session uh, examining some games and fun things in Jump. Uh, I'm going to be sharing links to scripts to download and, and add-ins so you can play with all of these on your own after the session. Just look in the uh, Jump On Air episode page for, for this episode. So let's start with a Sudoku solver. This has been around for a good long while. It's available on the Jump File Exchange. Here, here's, the, here's the page on the Jump File Exchange. Uh, if, if you are not familiar with the Jump File Exchange, this is where you can find all sorts of scripts and add-ins, things that people have written to add functionality in Jump. And uh, you'll find it uh, in the jump user community page, community.jump.com, and then, and then look for the file exchange. So uh, the Sudoku solver uh, is a jump add-in, and let's go through it together right now. Uh, it was made by David Rose, who, who uh, used to work with us here at, uh, at, at Jump, in, at SAS in the UK. And I'm just going to launch this Sudoku solver from my add-ins menu. Uh, if you install add-ins in Jump, you will see uh, this. Maybe you don't have this menu. That's probably because you haven't installed any add-ins. Uh, but once you do install add-ins uh, that, that come from other people, you'll have a menu for them. And that's where I'm going to find my Sudoku solver. OK, so uh, we start with a, a blank board. And I should mention that you're not going to really use this to play Sudoku, although I suppose you could. Uh, it's really to get help from the computer to have it solve your Sudoku. And uh, you can either enter uh, problems that you found in the newspaper or online or whatever, enter them one at a time here if you want. 
uh, I'm going to clear the board. The other thing that you can do is select one of the games from this archive, I mean, that refers to a different file that's saved on your, on your computer somewhere. And uh, let's just take uh, something not terribly difficult. Google calls this diabolical, and we'll load it. And if I click Solve Now, uh, you'll see that it's going to get solved in uh, three seconds, so it doesn't take very long at all. So most Sudokus that are designed for humans uh, are, are going to be easily solved uh, by, by this solver. Uh, to, to see what it's doing under the hood, I'm going to have to choose something that's uh, uh, really quite difficult uh, here. Let's choose something like this. It's called Seriously Hard. Uh, and we're going to take a look at uh, the way that the algorithm is trying to solve this. Uh, let's turn on both of these options. Uh, it's using a, a, an iterative approach. The first thing that the algorithm does is uh, try to fill in some simple squares using, using a, a standard logic, the same things you'd do if you were working on the Sudoku yourself. And then it does guess and check. Then it does what if analysis and it tries to say, after it runs out of logical things to do, it, it, it tries to speculate and see you know, what if this square was a three? What if this cell was a five? And it works through that. And when it hits a roadblock, it goes back. And it does that recursively. So what we're seeing here is a graph of uh, all the different suppositions and, and tries that the algorithm is going through and trying to use to uh, solve this Sudoku. So uh, this one is a seriously hard. It's not the fastest solver, and it wasn't designed to be, but uh, still, as a, as a homebrew effort and something that uh, you can apply to uh, solve a Sudoku, it's, it's really impressive, especially with uh, this mode over here where you can watch the algorithm at work. The third tab over here uh, has some settings that you can adjust to, to tweak the way that the, uh, that the algorithm runs. So yeah, really impressive. And if you're a Sudoku fan, uh, please check this out. It's a lot of fun. Uh, again, from David Rosen, you'll find it in the file exchange. Okay, so, uh, so it timed out. It was unable to solve this one in the time I gave it. So fair enough, we'll just, we'll just cancel. And rather than reset it and let it run using a, a higher settings, we'll just, we'll just move on to the next game. All right, the next one, I bet everybody remembers this one, at least people of a certain age, uh, Battleship. It's a board game, and uh, this is the one you remember it. It's where you have a grid, and you put your little ships on the grid, and then you communicate with your partner, and you try to sink your partner's ships, and they try to sink your ships. Uh, this is a script. It comes from Brady Brady, uh, who we heard from just a few minutes ago. And uh, he wrote it to play with his daughter. So uh, here is the jump script itself. And uh, we're not really going to talk about programming during this segment. Uh, but I did want to point out at least one thing to you. I wanted to show you the comments in here. If you write any code uh, in jump or anywhere, really, it's a really good idea to write comments in your code. Uh, for a couple of reasons, right? You're, you're going to come back and do versioning. You're going to come back and alter it. And uh, I can speak from personal experience. If you, if you do some programming and then you go away for a week or two and you come back and you try to write, try to read it, even something that you wrote yourself, uh, it can be really hard to remember what it is that you were trying to do in a certain place. So it's great to write comments just for yourself and also if you share this with other people and they want to extend your work. So uh, in JSL, the comments uh, are in green and the comments are what you'll see after these two slashes. Two slashes at the beginning of a line or even after some other programming code uh, make a comment. So Brady was kind enough to document the, his code for us a little bit and give us 
uh, an indication of what he was doing in certain places. So let's run this script. Uh, I'm going to click the green run script button on my toolbar. And uh, we're going to be playing Battleship against the computer. So our board is over here and the computer's board is on the left. Uh, we have two options. We can have uh, the computer randomly set up our battleships and you probably remember how this goes, right? You have boats with different lengths. So I guess this is an aircraft carrier length of five and a destroyer length of two and a submarine length of three. So yeah, I can click random setup and have, uh, uh, have the software do it for me or instead I can place things randomly. So I can click on any square and it's going to ask me, what do I want to place and where do I want to place it? So let's use that one for a battleship going across. There it is, B, 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 B. And let's place my aircraft carrier here going down, left click, and then aircraft carrier going down and so forth. So yes, you can place your, your fleet any way you like. So let's, let's hit a new game and do it randomly. Here's a random setup and let's play. So here's how uh, gameplay goes. We're guessing where the ships go over here and we take turns with the computer. Uh, Jump is going to guess uh, what happens over here on the right. So uh, I'm going to make my first guess with a left click. White means a, a miss. And then Jump took its first guess over here, also a miss. Uh, I'm going to guess again, miss, as did jump, miss, miss, boy, doing poorly. Let's try again. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay. So uh, I've missed completely so far, but, but jumps uh, hit my battleship, and uh, you don't sink it until you, you, uh, you hit all four squares in the ship. So... Uh, Brady wanted me to tell you all that uh, his algorithm, his AI, uh, could be smarter, but he designed it to play with his daughter, who was very young at the time, and, uh, and therefore, Jump is not guessing right next to, normally the strategy you would use is to, uh, I've, I've hit something here, I'd get some feedback that it's a hit, and I'd, I'd want to try to sink it. Jump's not doing that right here. So that's that's by design. And if you want to make this AI a little smarter, that would be a great JSL uh, project for anybody. I am really doing quite, this is, ah, okay, whew, I, I hit a battleship and let's, I was beginning to worry that there might be a bug in the program. So let's see, I sank the battleship and uh, jumps hit my battleship and my cruiser. I got to get lucky if I'm going to win, even with this uh, uh, AI that is not optimized. Let's see, there's the submarine. I, I've got three now, I think just an aircraft. Where's that aircraft carrier gonna be? Very few places it could be now. Aha, one, two, three, four, five. I did that and I think I have one ship left the cruiser, which has three squares. Let's see if we can find it. Oh boy. I hope jump doesn't beat me. That would be embarrassing. Okay, here we go. Congratulations, you sunk the enemy fleet. Whew. All right. So yes, here is a, a battleship script uh, from our own Brady Brady. Please download it and play with it. It's, it. it's good for fun. It's good fun. All right. The next one uh, is, is a space shooter. You've probably played asteroids at some place, at some point, uh, an old vector arcade and, and home console game. Uh, here is a jump version that was developed uh, a long time ago in jump version seven. Uh, by Alex Mamchuk, who was kind enough to share it with us. Let's run the Asteroids uh, script, and you can see how this one works. It is mouse-driven, and uh, the interface is a little bit uh, hard, but you'll get the hang of it if you start playing with it. You click away from your ship to move, and you click in the center of the ship to fire. So here we go. Uh, if I want to fire, I click right here in the middle. That fires my ship. 
If I want to rotate, I just go over here and click, click, click. If I want to move quickly, I click, I can click way out here. Oops. I've got a shield, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to die immediately. You can see I'm not great at this game. Boom. Let's run it one more time. Uh, you've got a shield so you don't die immediately, but you do have, you, you, it does run out. So uh, you'll, you'll want to be careful if you're playing this for real. Boom, 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 boom. I love the uh, multi-part asteroids. It really feels like the old game and the way that the uh, asteroids change trajectory when you hit them. Uh, it's, it's quite a bit of fun. So uh, yeah, this is fun to play with. Uh, it, it plays pretty well even today for something that, that's uh, been developed so long ago. Here's what's really fun. I reached out to Alex to get his permission to share this on the on Jump On Air. Thank you very much, Alex. And uh, what he told me was that the controls uh, were difficult for him to program at the time. He wanted to do the keyboards, but he couldn't figure out how to do it in Jump 7. But then when Jump 8 came out, uh, there was added to JSL the ability to load a DLL in Microsoft, a dynamic link library. This is where you access other, uh, other controls uh, in the Microsoft Windows operating system. So starting in Jump 8, he had new tools in his tool belt and he was able to use keyboard controls for his game. And he sent me two other things that he made uh, after Jump 8 was released a really nice implementation of Tetris. So here's Tetris. When I click this link, uh, I've got a jump journal that opens up much like this journal over here. Uh, the script to run this Tetris is here in the journal button. So uh, I'll click a new game and, and this plays a lot like you remember it. Uh, I'm using my keyboard now. Up arrow to rotate and uh, left and right arrow to, uh, uh, to move left and right, of course. Uh, the one thing it doesn't have, Alex, if you're listening or anybody who's ambitious and wants to work on this, uh, it would be nice to have that down arrow so that once you have it in the orientation you want, you could just slide it down into place. Instead, we have to wait and, uh, and let it drop. So not a real complaint, uh, but, but that's an opportunity for uh, uh, something to be added to this script. So it, it plays really well. Uh, I loved Tetris, I still do. And uh, I also encourage you to, to give this a try. Uh, great game, great script. So uh, I'm gonna quit and uh, it does keep a high score list. I'll enter it in here uh, and then here you could see it on the uh, uh, if I if I were to run a new game. Okay, so uh, that was Tetris. The last one uh, that I'd like to share with you from Alex uh, is kind of mind-boggling. It's a tank game. Uh, it's really impressive. If you remember the old Battle Zone, one of the early uh, arcade games where you had two joysticks and you drove a tank around in vector graphics. It's a little bit like that. Uh, I love that game. I lost a lot of quarters in that, I think. And um, the thing I should warn you is that Alex told me this is, a, this is an unfinished, uh, unfinished work in progress. I might crash jump when I try to uh, run this, but it's just so cool that I wanna take a chance anyway. And, and, and show it to everybody. So uh, please forgive me if we crash jump. It's, it's a work in progress. It was never finished, uh, but I want you to see this, this beautiful tank game even so. So here we go. It's off screen right now. I'll bring it over. All right, and let's launch tanks. Uh, this one is mouse driven and uh, I'm clicking to fire at the tanks. Oh, I better move. Uh, mouse up makes my tank go forward. Mouse backward, mouse down makes my tank go backwards. You can see the yellow circle uh, in the, uh, the yellow, oh, there it is, I have crash jump, yes. The yellow circle in the bottom right 
uh, is is a radar, and uh, it shows where uh, where the tanks are in relation to you. Uh, let's run it one more time because it's it's so much fun, uh, and I think I if I get lucky, it doesn't it doesn't crash. So we'll try it one more time. Please bear with me. Okay, I'm back up and running. Let's launch the tanks. And here we go. This time I'll I'll run away from the tanks. I think it I think it crashes when there are too many shots on the screen. No, I've done it again. Okay, so I'm sorry. I shouldn't have even tried, but uh, uh, very impressive for uh, for a jump program with all these beautiful uh, 3D graphics. So uh, if anybody wants to to pick this up and and work on it some more, uh, Alex has kindly shared it with us, and uh, there's a link to this script uh, that'll be available. Uh, for you to download after the episode. I have just a couple of minutes left, so let me run through one or two more things to share with you. Uh, another, uh, another game from Brady Brady. I love this one, Buzzword Bingo. Uh, it's a script. Uh, you can run this in a Zoom meeting, and uh, it is what it sounds like. You can you you see all the buzzwords that we've heard all too many times in these meetings, and every time you hear one, uh, you can click on it. And uh, you know, if you have multiple people running this script, uh, every time you run it, it it shuffles the elements in this board, and uh, and when you complete your bingo, it'll say bingo, and you can shout it out to the, to the Zoom meeting and tell everybody uh, that, that you won. A great feature that Brady added with here was the ability to add your own. So let's, let's do that in this jump table. I'm going to do some, forgive me please, flatten the curve, uh, maybe wash your hands. And uh, let's see. Social distancing, sign of the times, right? And now when we uh, play again, uh, yeah, those appear randomly scattered throughout uh, our uh, our bingo board. So there it is, uh, buzzword bingo, a nice JSL script that that I can share with you. All right, so uh, there are a couple of extras I'm not going to get to. Uh, Brady also shared a boggle with us. I have a text adventure written by Craig Hales. Uh, let me just close by mentioning uh, a couple of things that you can consider when giving people uh, uh, scripts or games to play with. Uh, Add-ins are a wonderful way to distribute your work because it makes it really easy for the end user. The end user gets a clickable menu item and uh, they don't have to run anything fancy. Um, if it's just a script, you can make your script a little bit easier for people to work with by making it an auto run script, okay? And that's what uh, Alex did for his asteroids. He made it auto run when, so that when I launch the script by clicking here, it runs automatically. Compare that to instead uh, the, the BS Bingo script, uh, which is just a standard script. You can make any script auto run uh, with the magic keystroke sequence slash slash bang slash slash exclamation point uh, at the beginning of the jump file. Once you do that, uh, then by saving that, uh, now when I click on it, it doesn't open as a script. It, it runs automatically. That's the auto run feature. And then if you need to be able to uh, edit it again, the easiest way to edit that again is to find it in your files list in jump, not double click it. That will 
that will auto run it. Instead, uh, right click edit script will, will allow you to edit that auto run script. And uh, journals are another great way to submit your work, especially when you have multiple files, multiple things as, as I've done here. And, and last tip I'll leave you with, please do comment your JSL code, make it easier for yourself and for everybody else. All right, so if you have any games, any fun things, any off-label uses of Jump, please share them with me. I would love to see them. Here's my email address at the top, jordan.hiller at jump.com. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you next time on Jump Can Do That. Julian, back to you. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Jordan. Those are fantastic games. And I'll remind everyone, visit us at the community, community.jump.com slash jump on air, and you get links to download all of those different games Jordan showed. And uh, great tips, Jordan, too, for, for all our budding JSL programmers. Fantastic. In our next segment, we have Ruth Hummel, Senior Academic Ambassador, to do today's stat snack, where we take a little bit of a bite out of a stat concept and put it in a bite-sized uh, piece. Welcome to this stat snack. We are going to talk about correlation. In common language, we use the word correlation kind of just to mean a relationship between two things, so like a co-relationship. But there's actually a very statistical meaning for something called the Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient, which we abbreviate with this lowercase r. A quick Google search of correlation turns up lots of interesting things, but let's focus in on this one at the bottom where it says a study finds a correlation between the amount of soda that children drink. This, uh, upon a little bit more investigation, is referring to some studies that were done on the relationship between soda drinking and violent behaviors from elementary and middle and high school students. This particular article is about high school students in Boston. So let's look a little more closely at this example. I've made up data showing the relationship or a hypothetical relationship between soda drinking and violence. And in this example, the Pearson correlation coefficient is 0.92. In this example, again, a hypothetical made up data, the relationship between these shows a correlation of 0.64. So the first thing you should know about correlation coefficients is they're measuring the tightness of this linear relationship. So something closer to one, like 0.92, shows less variability, and something closer to zero, like 0.64, is showing more variability. We can see this more closely if we put these density ellipses on. So the correlation coefficient is a measure of the tightness to this linear relationship. We could have a negative correlation coefficient, so negative 0.82 for this relationship, or we could have a very low correlation coefficient close to zero when there's basically no trend or no linear trend to capture. A perfect correlation would be a correlation of one, like in this example. And if we increase a correlation from basically zero up to one, you can see that a correlation of one is capturing that tightness. So the correlation does not tell us the steepness of the line. That's the slope of the line. The correlation just tells us the tightness to the line. So what is a correlation? It's a number from negative one to one. Around zero is a weak relationship. Close to negative one is a very strong negative relationship. Close to positive one is a strong on positive relationship that's really just measuring this tightness to a linear trend. But what isn't correlation? This is something that's rather commonly misunderstood, especially when people kind of mix up the statistical terminology of correlation with the common use of the word correlation. Statistical Pearson correlation does not actually tell us whether two variables are just related to each other. It only tells us if they are linearly related to each other. So in this example, I have shown a hypothetical relationship between soda and violence that's quadratic in nature. The correlation is pretty weak at 0.39 because the correlation is just measuring the spread compared to a straight line fit, a linear fit. Here, a perfect relationship between soda and violence, a perfect quadratic relationship, can't be captured with a good correlation. So the correlation is still very weak, even though the relationship is actually perfectly explained with a quadratic. So I've taken this plot from a Wikipedia article on correlation and dependence, and you can see on the bottom row all these relationships. There are relationships between X and Y in these data, but the correlations are all zero. So again, the correlation is just capturing that linear relationship. Correlation also doesn't tell us anything about causality. So 
possibly we think we have a correlation between soda drinking and violence, but soda drinking doesn't necessarily cause violence. Maybe violence causes soda drinking. Or maybe there's just no real relationship between these two things directly. If we find a correlation between them, maybe there are other mediating factors or other variables at play in that relationship. So remember, correlation absolutely does not say anything about causality. It just says, is there a tight, linear seeming relationship in the data? Related to that correlation is not causation, we might have other lurking variables and that might be what's going on. So it's possible that something else is causing both the soda drinking behaviors and the violence. So the correlation doesn't actually tell us what the relationship truly is. If there's causality or if there are other factors at play, the correlation is just a statistical measurement of how linearly related two variables are to each other. So what is that statistical Pearson product moment correlation? It's a measurement telling us how linearly related two variables are to each other. What it isn't is it doesn't just talk about how related two things are in general. So other shapes are not explained by that Pearson product moment correlation. Also, it doesn't tell us anything about causality, and we don't know what other variables might be at play that might help explain some of that relationship as well. So if you want to learn more about correlation or other statistical concepts, you should check out the Statistical Thinking for Industrial Problem Solving course. And now back to you, Julian. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Ruth. And yeah, do check out that Statistical Thinking course if you're interested in learning more about correlation and many other statistical topics. In our next segment, we have our resident ultra marathoner in training to take us through his topic called DOEing himself. Thanks, Julian. Well, good morning, guys. Coming to you from Austin, Texas. And today I want to talk to you about a designed experiment I created on myself to try and understand uh, how to run more efficiently. And as you can see, I am ready to go. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, so why am I doing this and who am I? Uh, I am a father and I have four small children all under the ages of 10 and my wife is behind the phone camera in this case. And uh, the reality is with four kids, a full-time job and uh, many a host of other things, I don't have a lot of time. And so I have recently discovered running, which I'll get to in a moment, but I, uh, I can't spend as much time running as I would like because I have four, five very good reasons uh, to keep me focused on things in my home. And so I'm trying to learn how can I be more efficient. So let me give you a brief history of who I am relative to riding, uh, running and then bring that back into design of experiment. So this all started less than a year ago. Uh, we took a family hike and I took uh, then my youngest who was a year old, I threw him in a backpack and we just went for a hike on relatively flat ground. And um, after 30 minutes, I was gassed. And I'm thinking I'm 35 years old, this is, this is not okay. So uh, that day I went for a run and then uh, it's summer in Texas, so why not start a new outdoor hobby? So uh, that, at that time from May through the summer, I started running three to five times a week, running maybe two to six miles uh, every time I ran and kind of started to get into a rhythm. I'd run with friends, then we'd go out for beers, which made it even more fun. And, uh, but by the time August came around, I was talked into running a trail race uh, out in the, what's called the hill country of central Texas. And um, I did a lot better than I anticipated uh, being possible. And I was hooked. It's kind of this, uh, I guess, competitive uh, streak I have. So I decided, well, I did a 10K, I should do a 50K next. So that fall, I began training for a 50K. And uh, classic story of Peter Polito. He finds something he likes and do, uh, likes to do, and he goes all out, way too hard, way too fast. Uh, so I got injured and I had uh, six weeks of up and down time. I finally got good enough, better enough. I thought, I'm just gonna run this race anyway. Maybe not the best decision, but um, I ran it. And for the first 25 kilometers, I crushed it. I passed everyone I came up, came up to. I was not passed by a single person. Then reality set in and the fact that I went way too hard, way too fast, classic story, right? And uh, I just crashed out. Um, I did finish the race 90 minutes later, it took me six and a half hours to run those 31 miles. Um, and immediately after the race, I thought never again. Uh, but a day after the race, I thought I gotta do this again. And so that's what got me started. How can I train 
in an efficient way without getting hurt and without taking up too much time. So I turn to design of experiment. So we've had a number of jump on air uh, episodes talking about design of experiment. So I won't spend too much time. I just wanna highlight that a designed experiment is a way to systematically evaluate the effects that particular inputs are gonna have on a set of outputs that you think are related. Um, on my own, I could think of things that are important um, and I'll get into what I think is important in just a moment, but to cobble them all together in a package set of experiments in a succinct way that didn't take me the rest of this year, uh, I'm not smart enough to do that. Uh, fortunately, Jump makes it very easy. And so that's what I've done. So let's talk about those inputs. What do I think is important to me running efficiently? And I wanna highlight that the inputs I selected are inputs that I am willing to control. There are certain things I'm not willing to control uh, about my life. I'm just gonna let happen and I'll, I'll highlight those in, in a moment. So the first thing is the coffee. Um, drinking coffee immediately before a race. I wanna know what sort of effect does this have on my heart rate? I run in a style right now in my training where I'm controlling my heart rate. So I don't wanna run faster than 144 beats per minute. And the idea is, is it keeps me in a zone where my body is metabolizing fat instead of sugar. And so coffee, that can mess with your heart rate. And so I wanted to know what sort of effect. Did it make me run actually slower if I was keeping my heart rate capped? Uh, also, I controlled meat intake. I didn't wanna control my entire diet. I am unwilling to log every bit of food I eat from now until eternity, but I am willing to turn certain types of foods on and off day to day. And so I wanted to know, does meat affect me? Does it make me sluggish? Does it affect recovery? Or does it give me that protein if I'm running this kind of fat uh, method of uh, fueling myself, does it actually help? Next, uh, I wanted to look at the effect of having a kind of um, uh, electrolyte sugar blend to fuel me while I run versus just plain water. In theory, if I'm consuming fat as I'm running, I don't need that sugar, but I don't know. So we're gonna test that out. Lastly, I'm a morning person. I like to get up uh, in the four or five o'clock hour when I go for my runs, I run in the dark. It's lovely. I sometimes see the sunrise, but lots of races go into the afternoon and I need to know um, into the evening what effect that's gonna have on me. And finally, I wanna know does pre-training, going for a quick aerobic workout on a rowing machine make me run more or less efficient? And then the thing that seems to have gotten the most press is I am testing running short length. There's a pet theory between myself and some other runners here at Jump that the shorter the shorts, the faster you go. And so I aim to prove this scientifically one way or the other. And lastly, I wanted to look at shoes. Does running in trail shoes on a road or road shoes on a trail have a, a major difference? The outputs I'm looking at is something called grade adjusted pace. That is, as I run up a hill, I'm gonna slow down. As I run down a hill, I'm gonna speed up. If I run in different courses, my actual pace will vary based on topography, this normalizes it. And then I'm keeping track of my heart rate. And then last, at the end of each run, I'm going to rank that run. How did it make me feel? Scale of one to 10 and use that as an output. So let's open up that experiment. And it's on the other screen here. So this is uh, how it breaks out. Uh, We've got my responses and factors, which we just went through a moment ago up here. This is the custom design platform. So I'm able to just choose an input, give it a range. And then down here, uh, Jump has designed a table for me to follow. So I have my run number, I'm blocking by week. So when I make the actual table, the, the table will be sorted by this block. And that is the reason is as I run, I presume week after week, I'm gonna get a little faster, a little more efficient just because I'm training and I wanna tease that noise out. All right. So uh, I've gone out and I've run, I'm blogging this in uh, pseudo real time, it's a little asynchronous. So we just published, pub, uh, published the one week review and I'm in the midst of finishing the second week review, but I'm actually almost complete with this. And so um, in a moment, I'll give you a teaser of some of the early results. Uh, but lastly, as I mentioned, there are a few variables that I'm just unwilling to track, or I can't, uh, I'm sorry, control. And so one of them is a fatigue score. The more I run, the more tired I'm going to get. And so I use Strava, and Strava has this feature for uh, people who give them $5 a month, and it's your fitness versus freshness. And so I wanna highlight this fatigue score right here, and that is this noisier line. 
And so every run, my heart's gonna exert energy, my body's gonna exert energy, and it gives me a fatigue score. So you can see here, it's saying after the run I did on Thursday or yesterday, that my fatigue score was 75. So if I were to run today, does that affect my effectiveness in my run today? Second is the weather. Also in Jump, I have a little app uh, plugin, and I've noticed that Strava is now doing this on their own. But uh, right here in the middle, it's this climate.app. If you wanted to add this, it puts it directly into your little description of your run, and it gives me the weather clear. It was 46 degrees. It felt like 39, and the humidity was 67%. So I go ahead and document those things. And then there are some other things that I'm just unwilling to mess with. Uh, first is sleep. I've got a two, almost three month old. I can't control his sleep to save my life. My wife can't, and so I'm not even gonna bother, but I'm gonna document it because I imagine a low sleep night's gonna have a greater effect than a night where I get eight hours. And then lastly, um, I am willing to control uh, meat or no meat, but um, I, I'm just gonna eat what I wanna eat. I'm gonna eat what we give our kids. I don't wanna make multiple meals. And so I'm not gonna control my weight. There's only so much I could control with respect to my weight. So I'm just gonna monitor my weight. Uh, it's kind of funny here, this is Good Friday and Easter, and so I fasted, and then I feasted, and so you see almost a five-pound swing, um, and I don't feel bad about that at all. Okay, so in the last few minutes, let's talk about some preliminary results. Uh, the first thing I just want to show you, uh, this is from the first two weeks. This is date on the X, this is run time on the Y, and so what it's showing is when did I start how long and when did I end? So this particular run started at 1.45 and ended at 3.45 p.m. And then it's color coded for my mean heart rate. And right off the bat, you can see that my heart rate tends to be lower in the morning. It tends to be higher um, in the afternoon. And I don't want to uh, give any correlation, you'll know, give a cause for this. A causation doesn't lead to correlation, but uh, it is an interesting observation that I will delve into when we do a full blown analysis at the end. Lastly, I did want to show that weather does seem to play a major role. And so on the X, I have start temp, relative humidity, and the basically a heat index. All of these are logged at the beginning of the run. And fortunately, the weather didn't change dramatically over the course of any of my runs, so we'll assume it's more or less constant. And uh, on the Y, we have my heart rate, my mean adjusted pace, uh, that gap, and then I have that perceived exertion. And if we look over here uh, on the, uh, left center, or sorry, right center, we see that uh, in the left center that this uh, temperature does play a major role on my pace. And so is this uh, the, the dominant? Is this a primary? Is this a secondary tertiary effect or cause? Uh, I don't know yet. The study is not complete, but this is an interesting observation. What is also interesting is it looks like higher humidity makes me run faster. And what I'll say there is that uh, in Texas, we get these really humid air masses. And so in the morning, the humidity is near 100, but it's also cooler. So that's a bit of a, uh, a misnomer there. And lastly, everyone is asking me about the shorts. And so I just wanna sh give you a little snippet of a very interesting bit of data. And I am gonna uh, claim some correlation, but keep in mind, I'm, I'm waving my arms here. This is not scientifically proven. But what we see here, is uh, my pace, my heart rate, and the perceived exertion on the left, and short inseam on the Y. And so what this tells us is that I run a little bit faster, my heart rate works a, a little bit higher, my heart works a little harder, and at the end of the run, I feel like uh, I've worked harder. And so what this tells me is, and I'm wearing them right now, you can't see them, but for you guys, I went all out. Um, I just wanna get home when I'm running in two inch shorts. I get out and I get back as quickly as I can. And so maybe shorter shorts do make you run faster, and maybe it's for a reason you didn't anticipate. Julian, back to you. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, I hope everyone checks out Peter's blog. You can find that link at our community page, community.jump.com slash jump on air, and we'll have a link out to his blog. And we hope we'll have Peter back on to take us through the final results of a study, because uh, we're all very curious what the, what the real effect is of those two in shorts. So thank you so much, Peter, for that. In our next segment, segment, we have Ryan DeWitt back in another edition of Have You Tried, talking about using column values as image markers. Using images as markers in jump graphs adds subject context to visualizations and can result in increased engagement.
You can create a column of images in Jump by setting the column data type to an expression, then dragging those images into each row. After that, you can additionally indicate that that column is to be used for markers by selecting Use for Marker from the column menu. Alternatively, you can use character or numeric columns as the marker. If you want to display both an image and other column values in your graph as shown here, toggle the Use for Marker settings in your Images column and give each column value that you want to display the label role. Right click the column panel and select label. Here I have the polygon shape column, the images column, set to marker. In Graph Builder, once I roll over the data point, I'll select the pin in the upper right. The next step is to right click that image marker and toggle on tagline. You can drag them around to clear other block data points and add as many as you need to communicate your point. This is helpful if you want to highlight some data points and their values. To resize the markers, right click the graph and choose graph, then choose your desired marker size. If you're interested in other tips and tricks, we have an extensive tips playlist on YouTube linked below. And of course you can search the community at community.jump.com. Have a great day. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Ryan. Uh, if you'd like to interact with Ryan and uh, request specific tips, make sure to do that on our community page, community.jump.com slash jump on air. We also welcome you coming over there after this episode to let us know uh, what you'd like to see more of in our show segments uh, and show suggestion sections and to comment and interact with any of your favorite presenters on any of their content within the show segment area. We also hope you'll follow us on all our different social media channels. We do have a lot to share and we do share frequently. So follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Be sure you check out the program guide coming to you on Sunday. Next week is a special week. Many of you know it is Earth Day coming up and we have a really great special Earth Day program for you. We have some fantastic speakers on. So we really hope you join us on Wednesday of next week to see our Earth Day lineup. That's the best time also to tell you to share us with your colleagues, certainly for Earth Day. If you think they're uh, like we all should be, caring and loving of the Earth, jump.com slash JOA is the link to share with them. That'll take them right over to the program page where they can subscribe for themselves. Either way, we hope you'll join us Monday, and we hope you stay safe. We hope you stay healthy. We hope you stay close, even if you're keeping your distance. Have a great Friday, and take care, everyone. Bye.